At this hour, a desperate search is underway for MH Flight 370. This is very rare. For an airplane to disappear uh, is not normal. The more urgent question is, where is the plane and its passengers? There's lots of pieces of information that when you layer them together start to really tell a story that's compelling. A desperate search turning up nothing to provide hope or closure until now. Are you a big fan of traveling? Particularly one of those people taking a leisure or work trip, either locally or internationally, by plane? Has it ever crossed your mind that you may go to an ill-fated trip without reaching the determined destination and just... <laughs> In this video, we are going to review the case of Malaysia Airline Flight MH370 and the enduring mystery of its disappearance in 2014. The name of this flight is associated with the bitter airplane crash and disappearance in the Malaysia Airlines history. So join me. Maybe together we can find some new clues because the mystery is still unsolved. The mysterious story of MH370 started from KLIA, or Kuala Lumpur International Airport. Before going any further, let's take a short trip to the city and its busy international airport. Kuala Lumpur, the beautiful capital of Malaysia, is one of the fastest growing metropolitan regions in Southeast Asia, both in population as well as economic development. Like the rest of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, or KL as usually called, has a tropical rainforest climate, hot and sunny with abundant rainfall. The city is the sixth most visited city in the world. Tourism is driven by the city's cultural diversity, gastronomic variety, and relatively low costs, making it a shopping heaven. Approximately 45 kilometers south of Kuala Lumpur city center sits the modern Kuala Lumpur International Airport, or KLIA. It is the main international airport of Malaysia, located in Sepang district of Selangor. It is not only the largest and busiest airport in Malaysia, but also one of the biggest airports in Southeast Asia and worldwide. KLIA was officially inaugurated on the 27th of June 1998, a week ahead of Hong Kong International Airport, and in time for the 1998 Commonwealth Games. It has three parallel runways, a first in the region, capable of handling 78 landings per hour. KLIA is made up of two main terminals, both very modern and beautifully designed. Okay, now back on track to the ill-fated trip for the passengers on board the plane. March 8, 2014. The 53-year-old Malaysia Airlines pilot, Captain Zari Ahmed Shah, with 30 years experience, signed for duty 10.50 p.m. Malaysia time, followed by the co-pilot, First Officer Farik Abdul Hamid, 27, who signed at 11.15 p.m. Captain Zari, born in the northern Malaysian state of Penang, had 30 years experience with more than 18,000 hours of flight, while the co-pilot Farik was engaged and planning his wedding. He had 2,763 flight hours, and this was the final training flight before the Boeing 777 exam for the co-pilot. At 12.27 a.m., Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 to Beijing, China, was given clearance to push back from the gate, and the clearance to take off was given at 12.40.37 a.m. Finally, at 12.42 a.m., MH370 took off from runway 32R at Kuala Lumpur International Airport with 227 passengers, as well as 12 crew members. It was scheduled to land at Beijing International Airport at 6.30 a.m. local time. Passengers from 14 different countries were on board. 
153 were Chinese citizens, three Americans, six from Australia, two from Canada, four from France, one from Hong Kong, five from India, seven from Indonesia, two from Iran, one from the Netherlands, one from Russia, one from Taiwan, and finally, two from Ukraine. However, all crew members were Malaysian. MH370 took off in a Boeing 777-2H6ER. The code H6 is Boeing's designation for Malaysia Airlines, and ER stands for Extended Range. The plane first flew on May 14, 2002, and by March 8, 2014, it had flown a total of 53,465 hours on 7,525 flight cycles. A cycle is one takeoff and landing of an aircraft. At 12.50 a.m., Malaysian Air Traffic Control, ATC, gives MH370 clearance to climb to flight level 350, approximately 35,000 feet. And at 1.07 a.m., the captain confirms that MH370 is flying at flight level 350. At 1.19 a.m., while MH370 was over the South China Sea between Malaysia and Vietnam, Malaysian Air Traffic Control, ATC, instructed the flight to contact the next ATC, which was Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. Captain Zahari replied, Good night, Malaysian 370. This was the final voice contact with MH370. After two minutes, the position symbol of MH370 disappeared from KLACC radar, indicating the aircraft's transponder was no longer functioning, or, in other words, being turned off. Malaysian military radar continued to track the aircraft as it turned left, crossed the Malay Peninsula near the Malaysia-Thailand border, and traveled over the Andaman Sea. At 1.30 a.m., at the request of Ho Chi Minh ACC, another aircraft attempted a voice contact with MH370 and received mumbling and radio static in reply. Nine minutes later, Ho Chi Minh ACC informed KL ACC that no contact was established and MH370 disappeared from its radar screen. At 1.52 a.m., MH370 reached the southern end of Penang Island. Co-pilot Freak's cell phone registered with a cell tower below, though no other data was transmitted. Then the airplane turned towards northeast along the Strait of Malacca. It was 2.03 a.m. when Malaysia Airlines Dispatch Center sent a message to the cockpit instructing pilots to contact Vietnam ATC there was no response. Nevertheless, at 2.15 a.m., Malaysia Airlines Operations Center informed KLACC that it could exchange signals with MH370, which was in Cambodian airspace. On the other hand, after contacting Ho Chi Minh ACC, KLACC was informed that MH370 was not supposed to take the route into Cambodian airspace, and Cambodia had no information about or contact with this flight. However, at 2.25 a.m., the aircraft's satellite data link, which was lost sometime between 1.07 and 2.03, was re-established. Thereafter, the aircraft's satellite data unit, or SDU, replied to five hourly automated status requests between 3.41 and 8.10 a.m and two unanswered ground-to-aircraft telephone calls. A search and rescue mission was launched at 5.30 a.m., while authorities had no idea where the missing plane was or whether it was still in the air. At 8.19 a.m., the SDU sent a logon request message to establish a satellite data link, followed by the final transmission from MH370 eight seconds later. Investigators believe the 819 messages were made due to power failure between the time of fuel exhaustion and the emergency power generator starting. Actually, 
It is believed that at the time a satellite received MH370 last confirmed signal at 8.11 a.m., seven hours and 32 minutes after takeoff. The flight was close to running out of fuel. Malaysia Airlines released a press statement at 7.24, stating that contact with Flight 370 had been lost. On March 9th, and within 24 hours, search operations began over the Gulf of Thailand. An oil slick was seen on the water near where the plane was last detected. However, later the source of the oil was confirmed by lab tests to be from a ship, not a plane. As the hours went by, the families of MH370 passengers gathered in hotels in China and Malaysia, awaiting the latest news about their loved ones who were on board. The degree of their disappointment and frustration was increasing, with authorities who were saying as little as possible. Despite the initial claim of Malaysia Airlines that the airplane would only have been able to fly for four hours before running out of fuel, it was later confirmed that MH370 had still been in the air for at least six hours after losing contact. As manifested on radar, the flight made a turn of almost 180 degrees and headed back to Kuala Lumpur shortly after radio contact was lost. Then it carried on to Penang Island, crossed the Malacca Strait and turned up the Andaman Sea before heading towards Sumatra in Indonesia. On March 10th, the search mission was expanded into the South China Sea when a debris was spotted near Hong Kong. However, Vietnam's search and rescue team could not locate objects in the water. Then authorities opened an investigation on the possibility of MH370 being hijacked or sabotaged by one of the pilots or crew members, leading to the plane's disappearance. A week later, shortly after Malaysia's Prime Minister confirmed and revealed that based on new satellite data, MH370 last made contact roughly seven hours after it vanished from civilian radar, police officers arrived at Captain Zahari's home in a luxury-gated community on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. It was claimed that Captain Zahari was a political activist who attended the trial of Malaysia's opposition leader just seven hours before he took control of MH370 with 239 passengers on board. Being certified by Malaysia's Department of Civil Aviation as a simulator test examiner, Captain Zahari had installed a Boeing 777 flight simulator in his home from which he made YouTube videos. Police found the sophisticated flight simulator with data deleted and removed it along with laptops from his home. The house of co-pilot, First Officer Farik, was also searched as part of the probe. The son of a high-ranking civil servant, Farik had joined Malaysia Airline in 2007 and had started co-piloting the sophisticated Boeing 777 only a little while prior to this incident. The results of investigation confirmed that the plane's tracking systems and the transponder were switched off before the pilot sent his final radio communication to air traffic control. This would require the specialized knowledge of one of the world's most sophisticated planes, indicating either a pilot or someone on board who had studied the plane's systems could accomplish this action. In fact, turning off the transponder requires someone in the cockpit to turn a knob with multiple selections to the off position while pressing down at the same time. On March 24th, Malaysian Airlines issued a statement saying, According to new data, flight MH370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean, and all passengers were assumed dead. An international search operation was started, with the Indian Ocean as the primary focus. Indonesia and Australia searched large parts of the southern Indian Ocean, while Malaysian authorities expanded their investigation to all passengers, crew, and ground staff present on March 8th. 
Malaysia's Prime Minister asked Australia to lead the ongoing search operation. Again, search planes failed to locate any debris from MH370. On the other hand, in Marsat, the British satellite company's analyses revealed that it was likely that the plane was disabled by a catastrophic accident due to its steady speed and flight path. However, on March 24th, Malaysia's Prime Minister held a press conference announcing that according to the latest satellite information, MH370 had flown along the southern corridor and crashed in the southern Indian Ocean off the west coast of Perth. In an attempt to locate the aircraft's flight recorders, including the plane's black box, which had a roughly 30-day battery life, a robotic submarine was deployed. At the same time, investigators confirmed that the pulse signals detected in the Indian Ocean by a Chinese ship were at the same frequency as the MH370's black box. Moreover, Ocean Shield, an Australian ship, picked up signals consistent with those emitted from an airplane black box in the northern part of the designated search area. The first signal lasted two hours and 20 minutes, and after the ship turned around, a second signal was detected and held for 13 minutes. Do you guess that finally, black boxes were found before their 30-day life ended? No. Unfortunately, a year passed. Families and friends of MH370 passengers and crews gathered in Kuala Lumpur, Beijing and Paris asking for more information and any probable results obtained during search missions. However, after several unsuccessful attempts to locate MH370 debris, the first confirmed debris was found on Reunion Island in the southern Indian Ocean on July 29, 2015, by Blaine Gibson. But who was Gibson? Was he an aviation expert? Gibson, a US lawyer from Seattle, started a self-funded hunt for MH370 in an exhaustive search from the Maldives to Mauritius and Myanmar. As he explains, I've been very involved in the search for Malaysia 370 just out of personal interest and in a private group, not in a for-profit way or journalistic way. Keen to help the families find closure, Blaine Gibson decided to go in search of more wreckage. He says, I went to the one-year commemoration in Kuala Lumpur and met some of the family members and families, and it inspired me to keep on looking. Nevertheless, Australian search teams had proposed the possibility of debris being washed up in Sumatra. Gibson followed the advice of distinguished oceanographer Dr. Charita Patiarachi, who urged him to search in Madagascar and Mozambique instead. Later, on February 27, 2016, Gibson discovered two more pieces of Boeing 777 debris on a beach in Mozambique confirmed to almost certainly belong to MH370. Further, in 2016, a large wing part found on a Tanzanian island and another fragment of a wing discovered in Mauritius were confirmed by Australia's transport minister as coming from the missing plane. In June 2016, Gibson discovered 15 to 20 washed up personal items on a Madagascar beach including a small backpack, a computer case, and several cabin-sized carry-on items. Finally, on January 17, 2017, the three-year, $150 million or £115 million search by Malaysian, Australian, and Chinese investigators was called off, according to a joint statement from officials of these three countries, considering the Indian Ocean to be the most likely resting place of MH370. In January 2018, under pressure from families and friends of MH370 passengers to find an answer about the reality behind the bitter incident, the Malaysian government finally signed a $70 million 
or £52 million 90-day deal with US private seabed exploration company Ocean Infinity to launch a fresh search in the southern Indian Ocean on a no-find, no-fee basis. The company searched 12 square kilometers per day to depths of 6,000 meters by using high-tech driverless probes. But unfortunately, it was cooled off after 138 days of searching without finding anything. Conspiracy theories. So far, there have been several suggested theories about the mysterious disappearance of MH370. Let's review them together. The leading theory as claimed by most experts is the pilot, Captain Zahari, deliberately crashed the Boeing 777 in a remote part of the Indian Ocean after carefully planning the murder-suicide. As Larry Vance, an air crash investigator from the Canadian government, explains, the aircraft didn't enter the water in the high-speed dive. It entered the water at low speed. Somebody at the end of the flight was controlling the plane. At the last stages of the flight, the pilot had the intention of putting the aircraft on the water in such a way as to cause minimal damage, to have it sink to the bottom in one piece, and nobody would ever see it again. It would be the greatest mystery in the history of aviation. At the same time, former pilot Mike Keane believes that Captain Zahari depressurized the aircraft and the passengers became hypoxic and unconscious, leading to their deaths. However, nothing irregular was found with Zahari's background, training and mental health. France is the only country still conducting a judicial inquiry into the crash, with two investigating magistrates looking into the deaths of the Waterloo family. Moreover, according to French investigators, an 89-kilogram load was added to the cargo list after the plane took off. French engineer Guylaine Watrelo, who lost his wife Laurent and two of his children, Adrien, 17, and Ambra, 13, who were on board of MH370, has been chasing answers about what happened to the airplane, and he believes it was shot down. He is convinced the plane was brought down on a foreign government's orders to eliminate something or someone on board. He says, Somewhere in this world, someone knows what happened, and it's not just one person. It's a big story. It's a dirty story. And it involves many countries. I strongly believe there was something or someone on the plane they did not want to arrive in Beijing. So they shot down that plane. Meanwhile, one puzzling issue is that the plane's co-pilot, Farik's mobile phone connected to a telecommunications tower on Penang Island moments before MH370's disappearance from radar. It is assumed that either he had turned his phone off before takeoff and then turned it on again mid-flight, or that it had been on the whole time but only then he tried to use it to send a text message or make a desperate call for help. In his 2015 book, The Plane That Wasn't There, Jeff Wise, an aviation expert, suggested a hypothetical scenario that the co-pilot may have been trying to send a text to inform people on the ground that a hijack was taking place. On the other hand, investigators have said they cannot rule out a third-party hijacking, although no terror group has claimed responsibility for the crash, and there is no evidence that the aircraft was being controlled remotely. Moreover, it was confirmed that none of the passengers had experience of flying a plane. Another theory proposes that lithium-ion batteries used in cell phones and laptops may have exploded or have caused the fire. According to the French reporter Florence de Changy, MH370 was carrying a shipment of electronic equipment over to China, which the US did not approve of. In her book, The Disappearing Act, The Impossible Case of MH370, she suggests that the US Air Force attempted to ambush the plane by intercepting tracking technology to cause the aircraft to disappear from radar screens. 
She claims that MH370 was shot down after a failed attempt at rerouting its course, and the matter has been covered up. However, with all theories surrounding the mysterious disappearance of MH370, British aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey claims that he has narrowed down the search area for the aircraft to just 115 square miles, and now pinpointed the wrecked aircraft's location to 33.177 degrees south, 95.300 degrees east. Ocean Infinity announced at the 8th anniversary of the disappearance that they'll start a fresh search early 2023, in conjunction with Mr. Godfrey. It is hoped that the new technology will lead to the discovery of MH370. As Godfrey says, it is my view that MH370 is found and that this mystery is solved, not just for the families involved who need closure, but for the flying public. If this bizarre story captivated your attention, don't forget to like the video, leave your comments down below, and subscribe to the channel. Meanwhile, by hitting the notification bell, you can stay up to date each time we upload a new mysterious case. Please, don't forget to share this video with your family and friends. Until next time, stay safe. We will be with you soon again with another shocking case.